I, I promise uh, I don't have a, a shtick. I'm not going to be speaking as Alan Sears. Uh, I don't have a play going on, but I do promise that I will finish within 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for the round of applause for that. <laughs> I've been asked to address you on the issue of the right of conscience. Therefore, to begin my talk, I'd like to give you a, a very, very basic legal lesson. The Council of Europe has 47 member states. These include the 27 EU member states. The one thing that all of these countries have in common is that they have all agreed to be bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. Article 9 of that convention is titled Freedom of Thought, Conscience, and Religion. Debate should be over. We should be across the street having tapas. We should be celebrating this. I do think it's a minor miracle of jurisprudence, however, that so many judges and legislators have managed to excise the term conscience from Article 9. It seems that here in Europe, even when we oppose so-called same-sex marriage, we can be labeled as homophobic. This even when 41 out of 47 Council of Europe member states have decided not to legislate so-called same-sex marriage and to define marriage as between exclusively between one man and one woman. This also, while the European Court of Human Rights has twice in two years said that the convention does not include a right to so-called same-sex marriage. Christian rights of conscience with regard to the opposition to homosexual behavior are under attack on two main fronts. One is through hate speech and the other through anti-discrimination laws. Now, I'm going to be describing these within the context of the homosexual agenda. There'll be a greater exposition, a more detailed expo exposition, uh, at 4.15 in Room 7, uh, hosted by Gudrun Kugler. Benjamin Bull will be speaking as Benjamin Bull at that event. So let's move now to the, to the issue of freedom of expression and how it affects conscience. One of the most dangerous weapons of the homosexual agenda is really its, its brilliance in aggressively attacking Christian speech and Christian rights of conscience and opposition to homosexual behavior and calling us hate mongers for it while at the same time keeping victim status for themselves. This approach neutralizes claims that opposition to homosexual behavior falls under the rights of conscience. It is therefore worth noting first what hate speech actually is. Fact is, no one knows. So I defer to my colleague, the great philosopher Humpty Dumpty. Yes, the one who sat on a wall and had the big fall, that one. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful uh, tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Alice replied, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be the master, that's all. Indeed, hate speech appears to be just what people choose it to mean. A recent fact sheet produced by the European Court of Human Rights uh, admits, and this is a quote, that there is no universally accepted definition of hate speech. And a previous fact sheet observed that, and again I quote, the identification of expressions of hate speech is sometimes difficult because this kind of speech does not necessarily manifest itself through the expression of hatred or emotions. So hate speech not ex being expressed through hatred. That's, that's an interesting one can also be concealed in statements which, which at first glance may seem to be rational or normal. So according to the facts, the, the fact sheets intended to simplify and explain the law at the European Court of Human Rights, hate speech is A, without definition, B, difficult to identify, and C, may often appear as rational or normal. Is this something we really want to criminalize? In other words, it is increasingly clear that whichever group shouts the loudest gets to decide what is and what is not criminal speech and gets to determine what we can and can't do by our right of conscience. There is no legal certainty, no foreseeability, and no clarity. Legally speaking, fail, fail, fail. Moving away from Europe for just a moment, I think everyone would acknowledge that the uh, that other places in the world have much worse conditions. Let's take Pakistan and their so-called blasphemy law, for example. I'll, I'll quote it here because it's really unbelievable. I, you have to hear it to believe it. 
whoever with the deliberate intention of wounding the feelings of any person utters any word or makes any sound in the hearing of a person or makes any gesture, any gesture in the sight of that person or places any object in the sight of that person shall be punished. This language could mean absolutely anything. What's most disturbing is that this law is also the law of Cyprus, an EU country. So it really, I mean, how can we manifest rights of conscience when we're dealing with such loosely worded legislation as this? When we think of Pakistan, we, we say, yeah, of course that's the situation. But what's happening in Pakistan as far as the hate speech laws might be closer to home than we'd like to think. Second, I'd like to talk about non-discrimination laws. The United Kingdom has proven again and again that the implementation of such laws is a recipe for oppression for the rights of Christian conscience. Just recently, a bed and breakfast owner had been successfully sued for refusing to rent out one of their rooms, a single bed, to a same-sex couple. They did this years before to a non-married heterosexual couple without incident. What's the difference? Foster parents have been refused the right to foster children because they oppose homosexual behavior. Catholic adoption agencies in the United Kingdom who have wanted to cleave to their Christian ethos have been forced to close because they wouldn't place children with homosexual parents. Two landmark cases really highlight what's going on. There is the case of Lillian Ladelli, a Christian registrar. She was a registrar long before the same-sex civil union laws were present in the United Kingdom. She said, as a Christian, I cannot participate, I cannot actively endorse same-sex civil partnerships. So she asked her supervisor to be excused, rescheduled around these ceremonies. Not a single client, not a single couple was affected by this. There was no undue hardship on the registry. Similarly, Gary McFarlane wanted to ensure that his strong Christian beliefs regarding homosexual behavior were respected by his employer. Gary is a deacon in his church. He's also a marriage counselor. We have to remember, same-sex marriage is not legal in the United Kingdom. So he asked his employer, I mean, his counseling, specific counseling related to teaching couples how to have better sexual relations to help save the marriage. So you can imagine doing this for same-sex couples would be a big breach of conscience. When he brought his concern to his supervisor, he was told that he would have to do it or be fired. He refused to do it, and he was fired for, I quote, gross misconduct. Now, these cases are epically important. I'll just, to close, I'll just mention, um, in 2009, there was 57,200 cases allocated by the European Court of Human Rights. These cases are at the European Court of Human Rights. There was an additional 200,000 cases in backlog. 90% of these cases have eventually been deemed inadmissible. So you have 250,000 cases. From May 1st of this year to October, there are only six oral hearings. These cases will be among those oral hearings. This is so important that next year at this time, we might not have these obstacles in our way. We, as representatives of the natural family, therefore have to remain vigilant. We must pray. And we must make a lot of noise. Parliamentarians, judges, and administrators must not be allowed to take away our rights of conscience. This is a legal challenge that we can win and one that we must win. Thank you.